How's it going, church? Welcome to Cornerstone. So great to see you all here in the room. Welcome to our online family as well. We're excited to worship Jesus with you. Lamentations 3.22 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. We're going to sing about that together. Let's lift this up. We have this confidence in Jesus. His blood has brought us into freedom. There is no other that can save us. Because we know, yes, we know it's Jesus. Come on. He is always with us. Faithful. Christ 
There's an old song I grew up singing, and it says, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And I wanna ask you today, what is your sacrifice of praise this morning? Maybe you walked in carrying shame. Maybe you walked in full of pain. Maybe you had a hard week. It was long, it was stressful, and now you're in this place and you feel numb. Maybe it's apathy. Maybe you didn't get the time with the Lord that you wanted this week, so you feel like, oh God, I can't, I can't. Lay it down this morning. Lay it down and worship Him. Because nothing should ever stand in the way of our praise. Here's the thing I've learned. Praise for the Almighty God should never be conditional. It should never be based on how we're feeling. It should be based on the fact that He is worthy of praise, whether we want to or not. And here's what happens. When you lay down the sacrifice and you praise anyway, your heart shifts, your spirit shifts, the atmosphere shifts, because let me tell you, if you don't know yet, He is in the room today, where two or three are gathered in His name. He is in our midst. And if you can't feel it, if you can't sense it, brother, sister, press in, press in, because He's here today. And He desires, He anticipates your praise, and He wants to move. your praise so we're gonna sing for a little bit more and I encourage you make these next few moments count make them count I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too and I won't be formed by feelings Come on, let's praise his name. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We give you glory, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You can be seated, church. So good to worship the Lord together. My name is Caleb. I get to be one of the pastors here, and I think it's super fitting that we were just singing about Jesus being first place 
in our lives, and it's Child Dedication Sunday, and we've got some families who are making that statement over their homes and over their children to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so they're coming up here, and as they, as they come on up, um, just a reminder of what Child Dedication is. Here at Cornerstone, we love the next generation. We have an amazing children's ministry of staff and volunteers that care for our kids so well. And we believe child dedication is simply a, a statement of saying, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We want these children to grow up in the fear and honor of the Lord. Uh, it's not a substitute for salvation. We believe that's a decision that these children will make one day for their, uh, on their own for themselves to receive Jesus. But yeah, it's just a great statement of intent to raise your kids to fear the Lord. So we're super grateful these families have done that. And yeah, we can clap for that. And uh, they've completed a series of classes to give them tools to equip them to raise their kids to fear the Lord. And my wife and I have two little ones. It's not easy, right? But this is your tribe, guys. This is your community. Lots of young families here at Cornerstone that are committed to doing life together and encouraging each other on the journey. So we're just going to have them introduce themselves and who they're dedicating, and then I'll read um, the family verse that they have chosen uh, for their household. And we are the Balakwi family, and we are dedicating our daughter, Olivia. Awesome, awesome. They say, our family is nothing without God. We will live out our faith with grateful hearts and integrity. We desire to be known for how we love God and love others. I love that. Acts 20:24 20, is their family verse. It says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Praise God. Praise God. We're the Browder family, and we are dedicating Madeline. Awesome. Hey, Madeline. She's chilling. She's ready. Uh, they say, we know our daughter is a gift from God. Uh, she's been with us through all things and gives us joy. Our heart's desire is to live out our faith with godly wisdom and love, trusting that God will help us serve others with kindness and compassion. And they've chosen Hebrews 12.1, which says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I love that verse. Praise God. We're the Nyokapi family and dedicating baby Nyla. Hey, so sweet. I love that. Uh, it says, my commitment is to model for my daughter how to be strong in the Lord through knowing and obeying God's word and being faithful in prayer. Praise God. They're, uh, yeah. And their family verse is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Can we give these three families a hand? I love that. If there's any family or friends of these three families in the room or any children's workers in the room, would you just stand uh, just to show your support? Any family or friends that are in the room? Yeah, that's awesome. Let's all stand together if we could. Let's all stand up together. Everyone in the room stand. and let, If you want to, you can stretch out a hand towards these families. Let's just pray over them this morning. God, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, that, that our children are a gift from you. And we thank you for these three families right now who are choosing uh, to set their hearts on you and to raise their children to fear and love you, Jesus. God, we ask that you'd rest your hand on these homes, that they would feel your peace and your presence with them. God, in the, in the good seasons, the easy days, and the hard days, Lord, we know that's an hour-by-hour hour thing. And we just speak grace over them in their parenting. And God, for each one of these precious little ones, that at the right time, they would choose to receive you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. And we thank you for it in your great name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. You can be seated.
Tuesday nights are better at Cornerstone. Every Tuesday, beginning at 6.30 p.m., bring your first through fourth grader to a night of games, friends, and worship at Kaboom! And while your kids are having a blast at Kaboom, you have the opportunity to dive deeper into Scripture at The Mine. Since they're going deeper into Romans, I felt compelled to be here. Tuesdays are better at Cornerstone. We'll see you Tuesday nights at Cornerstone. What is going on, Cornerstone Church family? How are we doing this morning? You guys good? Awesome. 1035, you guys are one of my favorite crowds, man. You guys get after it. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my name's Joel. I get to serve as our young adults pastor here. And you can normally find me hanging out with our 20-somethings on a Thursday night, but I'm so glad to be with all of you on a Sunday morning, praising the name of Jesus. And so if you're new with us, I just wanna say welcome. Maybe it's your first time, you're just checking stuff out or your third or your fourth time, but you haven't taken that next step into getting plugged in here at Cornerstone, we just wanna invite you to do that. We wanna make it super simple for you. And so a couple different ways you can get plugged into all that God's doing. First is on your way out of service before you get to lunch or whatever your plans are, make a quick pit stop in the lobby over to the left, you'll see our new here, start here booth. And there's a team of people who are gonna be super friendly, super excited to see you, get to know you, and give you a gift just for being our guest. We just wanna say thank you. Or for the tech savvy folks in the room, you can take out your phone right now, you won't hurt our feelings, and you can text the word new to 21999. We wanna send you some resources, some info, and again, just get you to connect with all that God's doing in our church. And so love to have you do that. I don't know if you caught it in the video, but word on the street is that Tuesday nights are better here at Cornerstone. And we firmly believe that. We have a couple different things that happen every Tuesday night here at our church. And the first one is called The Mine. And The Mine happens right here in this room every Tuesday at 645. And it's a special place where we set aside intentional time to go verse by verse through God's word growing in our knowledge of him, but more importantly, in our relationship with him. And so everyone is welcome to that 645 in this room. And for the little ones, our first through fourth graders, we have what's called Kaboom happening every Tuesday night. And this is a fully programmed evening where kids are gonna get to connect, have fun. They're gonna be begging you to come back every week, but more than that, we're gonna be helping them grow in their knowledge and relationship with Jesus as well. And so Tuesday nights, Cornerstone is the place to be. I wanna to talk to the women in the room. Do we have any ladies in the house excited to worship Jesus this morning? So good, glad you guys are here. I wanna make sure you're in the loop on something that's coming up just for you. We have our Remix Women's event coming on Monday, March 4th. Again, that's gonna be right here in this room. And this is a night where you don't have to register. There's no cost. It is absolutely free. But in this room, we're gonna worship. You guys are gonna hear a message from Megan Fate Marshman, who is on staff at Willow Creek Community Church. And she's no stranger to us. We know her and love her. And she's gonna point us into God's word and deliver a message that's really gonna impact the women of our church. And so you won't wanna miss it. Invite all your friends, ladies night out. If you want some more info, you can text the word REMIX to 21999. Lastly, church family, I'm so proud to get to stand up here and just be in front of a church who is so generous, trusting us with what God has entrusted to you. We get to move forward with what God wants to do here in Chandler and beyond, and it's a direct result of the way that you give, the way that you are a generous church. And so we just wanna say thank you. And if you haven't yet taken that step into generosity here at Cornerstone, we would just like to invite you to do that. It's such a joy to get to worship Jesus with our entire lives, including our finances. And so we wanna make that super simple for you. You can take out your phone and text the word GIVE to 21999. Well, we've been in a series called Experiencing God. It's been incredible so far, and it's gonna continue today. Pastor Lynn had an incredible message that he won't be able to be in the room for, but you're gonna wanna lean in. We're gonna have a video from Pastor Lynn. And so before we get there, go ahead and check this out. In October of 2021, both my parents caught COVID. 
you know, I remember being kind of bummed, thinking, man, you know, that sucks. You know, uh, we won't get to see my parents for a couple weeks. And while my dad got better really fast, uh, my mom actually got worse, and, and she continued to get worse. And then it was like I blinked, and, and she was being put in the hospital because she was having trouble breathing. And then, and then another blink, and she was being put in a coma and being put on a ventilator. And me and my brothers and, and my dad all being in the hospital room with my mom and, and we were praying and praying and praying for like an hour and a half. God, heal my mom, heal my mom, heal my mom. And then, and then the doctors turned off the machines and, and my mom passed away. You know, I'd love for this to be a story of, of God showing up at the 11th hour, of God healing my mom at the last minute. This isn't that story. I experience God in the midst of my grief. Our faithful God faithfully showed up in my darkest moment. And even today, you know, I'll drive by like a fast food place that my mom really enjoyed and, and a wave of grief will, will wash over me. And God still meets me right there, right in the middle of it. <laughs> Ephesians chapter two, right, it starts out by and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It says, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Um, he says, among whom we all once walked, living according to the passions of the flesh. And then it changes. And it says, but God, but God being rich in mercy, with, with, with great love, he saved us and seated us with Jesus. Those two words, but God, change everything. You know, we serve a faithful God who, who even when he says no, he still shows up and he still meets us in the midst of it. In the midst of my grief, he reminds me of his presence. He reminds me that, that I haven't been forgotten. I haven't been forsaken. And I do find just immense hope uh, and being reassured that I will get to see my mom in heaven someday. Hey, Cornerstone. Okay, sixth week in our series, Experiencing God. And today we're going to have a conversation about adjustment. And what we're going to discover is, is that if you determine in your life that you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it will require constant adjustment. There'll be places you think you're going to go. There's things you're going to think you're going to do. There's, there's plans that you've laid out, and then God is going to speak into your life and say, hey, actually, I'm, I'm sending you this way. And in that moment, you and I will have to make the decision, do I, do I stick with what I planned? Do I stick with what I thought was happening in my life? Or am I willing to make the adjustment to be part of what God is asking me to join? As we've been doing this uh, study together, we've been doing kind of a character study in the life of Moses. And just in case uh, you haven't been here or haven't caught it up, let me catch you up just for a moment, and then we'll talk about this idea of adjustment. So Moses uh, is living in Egypt. He's actually living within Pharaoh's house, despite the fact that he himself is a Hebrew. He's totally frustrated with God that God hasn't delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt's oppression. They've been slaves for 400 years. And Moses' heart says, hey, it's about time, God, you ought to do something. One day, Moses is out walking. He sees an Egyptian that's abusing a Hebrew and just, he loses it. He, he, he can't contain himself. He ends up killing the Egyptian. The next day he goes out and someone says, hey, uh, I saw you kill the Egyptian the other day. So then Moses knows that what he's done has become known and he flees Egypt. He ends up on the backside of the wilderness. While he's there, he gets married to a little gal named Zipporah. They start having children. He goes into the family business of tending sheep. He does this for 40 years and one day, as he's tending the sheep, he sees a bush off in the distance that's on fire. He watches it. He wants to see which way the fire is moving. Is it coming toward the sheep? Lo and behold, the bush keeps burning. It doesn't burn out, but it doesn't move either. And so he goes over to investigate, and God begins to speak to Moses from the bush. And as God speaks, he says to Moses, Moses, I've got an assignment for you. I'm going to send you back to Egypt. 
which causes a crisis of belief for Moses because he's going, well, look, God, I'm probably the last guy who ought to go to Egypt. I'm a fugitive there. If I were to go back to Egypt, uh, I would, at the very least, probably be thrown in jail, if not worse. He begins to make excuses. Matter of fact, he spends a chapter and a half telling God why the plan is flawed and why he's not the right guy. And at every turn, God answers his objection. And now he comes to a moment in which he's got to make a decision. Am I going to obey God? Because I'm telling you, this, this plan sounds crazy. This, this plan sounds way, way too big. And it, Am I going to obey God? Or am, am I going to just stick to the plans I already had for myself? See, obeying God means I'm going to make a major adjustment in my life. I thought my life was this, and now God is saying, no, it's that. Will I adjust? If I were to have a conversation with God about you, in other words, if I went to God and I said, hey, God, what is it? What is it in James's life, in Sarah's life? Put in your name. What, what is it in their life? that you've been having a conversation with them about? What's the thing that that in your heart, God, is next for them? Uh, The relationship they need to do differently, the way they need to handle their finances, whatever it is, God, what is that conversation you've been having and they've been hesitating? What's the place in which they need to adjust their plans to your plans? And I want you really just to take a moment and say, and think to yourself, if I had that conversation with God, what would God tell me about you? What would be the thing that God would say, this is next. This is the thing that needs to just and change in your life. Here's what we're going to discover. You will never truly experience God until you make the adjustment. The adjustment will always be scary. The adjustment most likely won't add up or make sense to you. But if you live on your side of the adjustment, in other words, you stick with your idea and your plan, you will not fully experience God. It's only on the other side when I say, you know what, I'm going to live this moment in obedience. I don't understand it. I don't agree with it. But I am going to adjust my life to be obedient to what God has asked me. And it's then that you and I begin to experience God in his fullness, in his richness, the way we were always intended. All right, let's jump back to our friend Moses. You realize Moses, as he sits in this moment, literally has a pretty simple decision. If I'm going to obey God, my life has to get different. See, Moses, Moses already has a plan for his own life. Uh, he's only a couple years from uh, shepherd security benefits, uh, he's been paying off his camels. He's been putting a little bit away in an IR way. His wife, Zipporah, and him have been talking very seriously about downsizing their tent. And he's going to slip into just a very serene and leisurely retirement. That, that's where he's headed. And now all of a sudden, God comes and says, no, no, no. I have a major assignment for your life. I, th- this isn't a leisurely retirement. This is, this is you doing something bigger than harder than you've ever done in your life. This is you all in. I'm sending you back to Egypt. And guys, here's what you need to hear. Moses hasn't even ever considered going back to Egypt. This is the last place. It's the last place Moses would ever decide on his own to go to. And yet it's the thing that God is asking from him. And the only way he can do this is if he's willing to adjust his plans to God's plans. And guys, here's what you need to know. This doesn't just happen to Moses. It's gonna happen to you and me time and time and time again. That God is gonna speak into your life. It'll it'll be a moment when you're reading scripture. It'll be a sermon that you hear. It'll be a moment in which you're praying and all of a sudden you feel convicted about something or a need to do something in which God invites you into his plan, which means you'll have to adjust and step out of your plan. When God speaks, it always requires 
that you and I adjust. For some of us, it's going to be adjusting how we date. For some of us, it's going to be adjusting how we spend our money. For some of us, it's going to be what we do with our anger. For some of us, it's going to be how we treat our spouse. But I'm just telling you that every time God speaks, you and I will come to this same moment that Moses did at the burning bush that says, if I'm going to obey God, then my life is going to have to adjust. It's going to be different on the other side of my obedience. Grab your Bibles, go with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 9, if you're not familiar, if you go to the back of your Bible, work to the left, you're going to find this book of Luke, Luke chapter 9. It's part of the four books we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the stories of the life of Jesus. Luke chapter 9, and in this passage, three different men are going to encounter Jesus. Their, their first instinct is, hey, Jesus, I, I want to follow you. I, I want to you know, do what you want me to do, and I want to be with you. But then they come face to face with the adjustment that's going to be required in their life to follow Jesus. And when they see it, all three of them will be unwilling to make the adjustment. God, that doesn't fit my plans. God, that's not, that's not what I thought my life was going to be like. And all three of them walk away. Here we go. It's, uh, it's Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. And here's what it says. As they, talking about Jesus and the disciples, were walking along a road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. Look, I'm, I'm all in. I'm, I'll go wherever you go. Jesus replied, hey, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Here's what's happening, I believe, in that moment. As this man says, hey, look, Jesus, I'm all in on you. I'll go wherever you want to go. Jesus looks into his heart. And looking into his heart, he realizes, hey, uh, this guy still has parts of his life that he's not willing to surrender. He's got things that would cause him to hesitate. And so he says, hey, just so you know, hey, following me isn't easy. Hmm. See, see you, you thought that if you came and followed me that everything would be better in your life. The truth is, if you follow me, it's actually going to be harder in your life. Hey, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. And in that moment, you can almost read the young man's mind that he says, oh, I, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, Jesus, you're crazy popular and you're probably getting like these massive offerings in. And so I was guessing you're staying in the best hotels and you're eating at the best restaurants and you're telling me this is like a ongoing camping trip? Well, Jesus, that sounds like loss to me. That sounds like sacrifice because, I mean, right now, I've got a house to live in, albeit with my parents and I'm 43, but I've got a house to live in. i got a soft bed and my mommy makes me breakfast every day. What you're describing, Jesus, looks like I'm losing, not winning. It sounds hard, not easier. Guys, I'm just going to tell you that if you make the commitment to follow Jesus Christ, it will be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. I, I hate when people go, oh, you know, Jesus is just a crutch. Oh, you know, it's just, it's just a cop out. You try following Jesus. Because I will tell you that, that in a culture like the culture we have today, with the momentum moving in the direction that it's moving, following Jesus will be the hardest thing you ever do. So count the cost. Be ready when what Jesus asks you to do says, hey, that looks harder than I thought, and that, that even looks like maybe sacrifice on my part. Yeah. And are you willing to adjust to what he's asked you to do? There's a second young man who comes to him, starting in uh, verse 59, and he said to another man, hey, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. This, this man's struggle is, hey, Jesus, if I follow you, I might lose some things in my life. It sounds a little strange when he says, hey, let me go uh, bury my father. Here's what Jesus says in reply. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
And you're like, well, gee, wait, geez, that's, that's pretty tough. I mean, his father apparently has died and anyone would want to go to the funeral. That's not what's happened. You need to understand that in this time and in this culture, uh, there is no social security. There are no retirement plans. So what would happen in the culture is when your parents got too old to work, you would then take them into your house in their elder years and you would care for them and that's the way you would secure your inheritance. So what he's really saying is, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you, but honestly, right now is not a convenient time. Let me secure myself. Let me, let me make sure that financially I'm stable enough and all of that's taken care of. And then once I do that and my father does eventually die, then I'll come and follow you. But if I were to follow you now, I might not get as much as I'm gonna get. Dad may be frustrated with me and my inheritance may be smaller than it would be if I stayed and I helped. And guys, there will be moments when you and I follow Jesus where there are decisions that will go, you know, Jesus, that looks like it costs me something to follow you. And things already feel tight enough. I had a gentleman that came to me um, several years back and he said, hey, Lynn, just want to let you know that I, I just got this great promotion at work and it's going to pay more and I moved up you know, the, the scale a little bit. I got a new title. And he said, but it's, it's turning into a really hard decision. And I said, well, why would that be a hard decision? They're going to pay you more. You're going to get a better title. He says, well, here's the thing. I'm, I'm going to become a supervisor, uh, but I'm going to be the low supervisor on the totem pole, which means I have to work on weekends. And it'll probably be for two or three years before I'll have enough seniority that I can move off and the next supervisor will have to move in. I want you to know that I said the next things I said to him in, in a spirit of gentleness. Here's what I said. So what you're telling me is that in order to secure a promotion, a better title, and to earn a little bit more money, you're considering putting your walk with God on hold for two or three years. You're not gonna be in church where you're learning the word. You're not gonna be around other Christians who are encouraging you and challenging you and holding you accountable. You're, you're gonna be away from the fellowship. You're, you're gonna put that walk with God on hold, mostly for the better part of two or three years. And what message will that send to your children? That if the price is right, then you can set God to the side. And then I said to him, it doesn't sound to me like it's a hard decision at all. That one should be pretty simple. And guys, I'm just telling you, there will be moments when following Jesus is gonna feel like, hey, I. If I speak out about my faith, I probably don't get that promotion. If I'm honest about that, I'll have some people who are frustrated. There'll be moments when it feels like following Jesus means less. Will you adjust your life and do what he asked you to do? Or do you stick with your plan? There's a third young man. It's verse 61. It says, and still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. This one's a little more obscure. This one's a little harder to understand what Jesus is pushing back into. I've got two ideas of maybe why Jesus is saying what he's saying. The first one is this. What if Jesus knows that if he goes back to say goodbye to his family, his family will begin to say, hey, that's crazy. You were supposed to be going to college next year and, and you knew were gonna be a lawyer and now you're gonna leave all that and you're gonna go follow Jesus. I mean, that's, that's stupid. And that, and that he will be so deeply influenced by what his parents say and his family says that he'll just chuck the whole thing. And Jesus says, look, you're gonna to have to make a decision. Are you gonna go back to your family and, and cave in or are you gonna come and follow me? When I first felt called to ministry, <clears throat> I went to my family members and the majority of my family members said to me, Lynn, that's, that's crazy. 
and, and they were Christians. And, and they were well-meaning. They weren't, they weren't trying to be angry at God. or They were well-meaning. Uh, some of them, my grandfather had been a pastor. And they had seen what it cost him and some of the pain he went through in leading a church. And they didn't want that for me. And they said, Lynn, you, you, don't, you don't want that. Uh, some of them just said, hey, Lynn, I think it'd be a waste of your talent, a waste of your abilities. And I had to respond to him and say, guys, this wasn't my idea. I, I didn't want to go into ministry. But I believe with all my heart that God asked. And if I have to choose between what God is asking me to do and what you're encouraging me to do, God wins every time. And guys, there are some of us that when we're at work, we act one way because that's what the culture at work expects us to act like. And when we're at home, we act a different way because that's the culture of our home. And then when we get to church, we act a different way because we're people pleasing. And the reality is you and I are supposed to live to the applause of one there should be only one person's opinion who you and I care about. All right, confession time. How many of you would be honest and go, I've watched a Hallmark movie before? How, how many men? Come on, men. How many men? All right, all right. You can check your man card at the door. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in about every fourth Hallmark movie, there's kind of the same thing going on. Uh, one of the children is in a... In a uh, thing, you know, like a talent show type of thing, and uh, they're a little afraid, and they're a little worried, but they finally decide they're going to do it, and so they get up on the stage, and they, they play their violin, or they sing their little solo, and now everybody in the crowd is applauding, and everybody loves what they did, and then you watch that little kid start searching the crowd, because in that moment, the applause of the crowd doesn't matter. They're searching the crowd for one person. Is dad there? Is mom there? And when they see them, and when their eyes lock and when they see them applauding, everything's okay. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That the applause and the opinions of the crowd don't matter. You're looking for the applause of one. And as long as God is thrilled, and as long as God is satisfied, I'm good. There's a second option about maybe why Jesus responds this way and says, hey, don't, don't go back, but choose to follow me instead. <clears throat> it may be about time. If you remember the beginning of the chapter, it says Jesus is already traveling on the road as he's encountering these people. He's headed somewhere else. And, and what this guy is in essence saying is, hey, look, uh, yeah, I'll follow you, but there's something else that I need to do first. There's something that's more important. And, and so, Jesus, if you would just stay here and wait till I can go take care of what I'm gonna take care of, then I'll come back. And all of you disciples, if you would just sit down and wait till I'm done, and oh, by the way, that city you're going to, that there are people that need to be healed and people that need to connect with God, if they would just wait till it's convenient for me. I want you to imagine with me for a moment, you've got a 14-year-old son and your son comes to you and says, uh, hey, uh, I'd like to go spend the night at my friend's house. And you say, well, that, that's okay, but you remember tomorrow's Saturday and we're supposed to be working out in the yard together and there are things that we've got to do that takes two of us. It's too heavy, too big, it's gonna take, you know, so you gotta be here so you can go spend the night as long as you're back by 8 a.m. in the morning. Your 14-year-old son says, absolutely, I'll be here. They go, they spend the night, you get up the next morning, it's eight o'clock, no son. You go out and start working in the yard by yourself. You have to try to push around those things that really take two people to do, and you're doing that alone. It comes to five o'clock in the evening, and your son shows up. And you go, hey, where were you? Well, me and my friend, uh, we decided to go to the mall. And uh, we went in the video store, and we were hanging out there. There's some really cool new games, and so we tested them out. And then I went to the skateboard shop. I found a skateboard, Dad, that I'd really like for you to buy me for Christmas. <clears throat> and you go, well, hey, wait a minute. You were supposed to be here. And your son replies to you and says, well, me being at the mall doing what I wanted to do was more important than doing what you wanted me to do. At this moment, you're considering whether or not your 14-year-old son is ever going to be 15. 
you're thinking, I got a shovel in the garage and I could come up with a good alibi right now. But how many times do we do that to God? Hey, God, here, here's the deal. Uh, I mean, I would serve in church, but you know right now the kids are all involved in soccer and we're out there you know, every weekend and practice and everything else. And so when that gets over, because actually that's more important than serving. Hey, God, you know, work's really, really tough and I'm only a couple of years from retirement. So once I retire, maybe I'll join one of those growth groups and get really serious about my walk with you. But if you would just wait till it's convenient for me because what I'm doing right now is more important than what you're asking me to do. And maybe the reason Jesus pushed back is over time. But here's the deal. Every single one of them, seeing what it costs, seeing the adjustment that's going to be required to follow Jesus, in that moment says, I'm not going to make the adjustment. I'm not going to do it. And <clears throat> Don't you just want to take these three young men that all turn Jesus down and shake them? Say, guys, guys, do you realize by turning Jesus down in that moment because it looked hard or it didn't fit your schedule? Or Do you realize you could have had a front row seat to all those miracles? You could have sat at the feet of Jesus while he explained life. You could have been part of a movement that turned the world on its head and is still changing people today. And you turned it down because making the adjustment wasn't convenient for you. And that brings us to the question, what will you do? What will you do with that moment when God says, hey, I'm going to ask you to start tithing. Hey, I'm going to ask you to date differently. Hey, I'm going to ask you to start serving. It. What are you going to do in that moment? Are you going to make the adjustment? And what is it that God was going to do in your life? What is it that you were going to experience of God on the other side of making that adjustment that you will never know if you don't? When we face adjustment, it forces you and me to answer this question in my life. Who owns me? See, if I own me, then it's my decision to make. But if God owns me, there really actually isn't a decision because the owner just told me what he wants me to do. Grab your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians. Again, if you don't know how to get there, if you go to the back of your Bible and then start working to the left, you're going to find this book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 19. This is Paul talking to the Corinthian Christians, and he says to them, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you received from God? Are you ready for this? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You ever made a bad deal? I mean, one of those things where, you know, you bought something and then you realize you could have bought it for way, way less and then you, you, it just bugs you to death. So about 20 years ago, my mom was in Costco. She saw these amazing nativities right before Christmas, and she bought each of the kids one of these just, it's huge, it's a huge nativity. All the characters are like 11 or 12 inches tall. They, they've actually got like real clothes on them and the hand painting on them is unbelievable. <clears throat> and so we set it up every year. The problem was that Jesus has lost his hands. I'm not, I'm not sure how, but over time, his hands are broken off. So I went online and thought, hey, I'll see if you know, somebody's selling a baby Jesus. And uh, as I do that, no one, no one is. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, because these things are like 20 years old, maybe there's like an, a, a similar nativity set has a baby. I'll just buy it cheap because it's old. As I looked on, I guess every year Costco puts a different one out. None of them is good as the one that I had, and they're all selling 400 plus. I'm like, that's, that's insane. So to this day, Jesus has broken hands. But um, 
This last Christmas, I'm online and uh, I happened to see this advertisement for a nativity. And, and if you looked at the pictures, it has these like massive characters. They're unbelievable. They're beautiful. It looks like they have, you know, like real cloth on them and everything. And it's on sale. You ready? 150 bucks. I'm like, I'm in. I'm in. So I get, send my 150 bucks. It arrives two weeks after Christmas, by the way. And then, you ready for this? This is what they sent me. It is February, and I am still angry about this. This, this. this was a bad deal. Are you mocking my pain? Is that why? I, you're laughing longer about that than... You realize when Jesus paid for you and me on the cross, it was a bad deal. Let me explain why. Because if you take the value of every single human being who has ever lived on the face of the earth and add that value together, and then you take the value of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it's not even close. God got ripped off. He paid way, 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 way more than you and I are worth in order to redeem us. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about this. I mean, here's what it says about Jesus. For the joy set before him, what joy? The idea that he would allow us or enable us to be forgiven of our sins and reconnect with God, that was the joy of the cross for him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame. You get what it's saying? Jesus said, no, I know this is a bad deal. I don't care. I love them so much, I would do this a hundred times so that they would know me and know my Father. Guys, that's incredible. No Christian, no Christian has the right to ever say again, my life is my life. No, it's not. You and I were bought with a price, and the price that God was willing to pay for you was a bad deal for him, but he loved you and me enough that he gladly paid it. If God owns you and me, then he has every right to ask, and our obedience should be automatic, right? If he owns you and me, then anything he asks, we ought to willingly just say, well, God, yeah, because you're the owner, and I'm not. Grab your Bibles one last time. Go with me to the book of Romans. And again, if you're looking forward, if you go to the back of your Bible, work again to the left. You're going to find this book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what it says. Therefore... I urge you, I beg you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. What was that? That's Jesus going to the cross on our behalf. That's Jesus doing the bad deal because he loves us so much. In view of God's mercy, in view of what he's done for you. Some of you guys have heard my story about how my parents split when I was nine and that my mom raised four children, the youngest of which was autistic, all by herself, very often she had two jobs. There were years that went by that she never got a new piece of clothing because we couldn't afford it. People were bringing us bags to wear. And the bravery that my mom had, the fortitude, the love that she had to keep our family together. There's nothing I could do to repay that. Matter of fact, a few years back, my mom had, had bought a house back before the sprinkler systems were normal, and I'd been over there, and I was watching my mom, you know, take the hose and, you know, do the sprinkler that does, how, how many remember that? You're old. Okay, so, she, you know, she's having to move that around, and, and, I, and I just said, hey, mom, you know what, let me put a sprinkler system in for you, and so I was out there, 110 degrees, digging the ditches, putting in the pipes. A couple years later, I went into my mom's kitchen and one of the cupboard doors just like fell off. And I said, hey mom, let me, let me, let me put in a new kitchen for you. And so I, I took the two weeks of vacation that I had and 
spent all of my time putting a new kitchen in for my mom. My mom didn't even ask for either of those two things. You know why I did them? Because if I did something for my mom every single day from here until I die, I would never pay her back for what she did for me. And guys, if you did something for God every single day from here till you passed away, you would never come close to paying him back. It's why Paul said, in view of his mercy, in view of the thing that he's already done for you. And then he goes on. <clears throat> in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. And the Jews hearing this would have known exactly what he was saying. What you did in those days, because it was part of the sacrificial system, every single year you went to your herd, you took your best lamb. Your best lamb. You took it to the temple, and you laid it on the altar, and they killed it. You'd never get it back. It would never mate and have more lamb. Right? You, you took your best lamb, and you gave it. And then he says that you would offer your lives, that you would say, God, I'm taking my life, the life that I thought I owned, that I didn't own, and I'm putting it on the altar. And I'm never taking it back. I get that it's yours and not mine. And then he goes on. <clears throat> Brothers, I urge you by God's mercy to offer your bodies living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper act of worship. What's worship? Worship is any moment I put God in his right place. Worship is saying to God, you're the owner, I'm not. So when you came and spoke to me and you told me I needed to date different, you told me I needed to use my money differently, you told me that I needed to turn down the job, I didn't even have to think about it because you own me and I made the adjustment. So let me ask again. Remember where we started. If I were to ask God, what's the thing we've hesitated on? What's the thing we've wrestled with God and said, God, maybe when I'm done and maybe later and maybe if it doesn't have to be so hard, then maybe I would do it. Would you make the adjustment? Would you say, God, I'm done arguing. You own me. I don't own me. And in light of what you've done for me, I would make that decision for you a hundred times over. So my answer is yes. Take my finances, take my children, take my merit, yes. And I'll adjust to what you're asking me to do. Let's pray. Hey, dear Lord Jesus, all too often in our lives, we've been like the three young men. That when you asked, our response was, hey God, this is, this is too hard. Or, or we said, you know what, God, if I were to obey you in that, it feels like I would lose something. I, that I would be sacrificing something. Or, or maybe we said, God, I'm so busy. If you would just wait for a more convenient time for me to obey, then I would obey. In light of your mercy, in light of what you've done on our behalf, the answer is yes. We'll make the change. We'll adjust our lives to what you're asking us to do. No more arguing, no more excuses. We'll adjust. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Cornerstone family, we love worshiping Jesus with you. Thanks for being here. If you have any needs for prayer, our team will be down front. Feel free to come forward or you can text prayer to 21999. We love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so honored that you would call Cornerstone your home online. Um, we would love to pray for you. You don't have to do life alone. If you need prayer, you can text prayer to 21999. And I can personally tell you, because I'm one of the staff members, that we pray for every single prayer request that comes in here. And we will write you if you have an address. So we love you guys, if not, and we'll see you again next week.